As we find our seats, we'll find loop number 16. Luke chapter number 16. You know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, right? What you believe will basically help determine how you think about yourself and the world around you, about the God that governs the world and your place in it. Your beliefs are critical because it governs your thinking, and what governs your thinking governs your behavior. In the big sense and in the nuanced sense, the various nuances of our lives. Spirituality, particularly Christian spirituality, is often contrary to the world's wisdom because it is contrary to the human nature. The human nature, of course, being sinful and corrupted, and in its very essence, we are selfish and our nature is selfish. It's about accumulating for ourselves things and power and the very things that are temporal in this world. And, of course, God gives us a balanced view of dealing with these things, about dealing with the gathering of things, the ownership of things, property, amen? The Bible is not against property or property rights. It's not against us owning materials or, material, or having material wealth. But there is a movement of people today that create a theology by misapplying the scripture to their own ends to try to, try to elevate poverty as something to be achieved. And though it sounds ridiculous and it sounds counterintuitive, uh, there is a segment of society that, theologically speaking, has uh, done that with Scripture, and they play fast and loose with the Scripture. They, they hold the Scripture in a fast and loose kind of way. They do not feel completely bound by Scripture, but they find the usefulness of Scripture because people whose religious thinking is shaped a certain way, and the Bible being an authority that they themselves do not believe in, and yet they will use it as an authority. They will use it to shape people's thinking, to dictate their policy and behavior in this world. It gets to be a little bit nuanced in some ways for some people, and to others it is like a flashing neon sign. Luke 16 is interesting because Jesus challenges us uh, in this area about the rich man and the poor man, about the, the working poor, and of course then the destitute poor. The second half of the chapter deals with the rich man and Lazarus. Of course, Lazarus is a beggar, and Jesus is not uh, extolling the virtues of becoming a beggar. He himself was never a beggar, amen? He depended upon God. We don't see Jesus hanging out at the temple with his hand out uh, on the steps saying, support me. I refuse to work or I can't work. And it's one thing if you can't work and it's another thing if you refuse to work. Jesus worked aggressively. He was an itinerant preacher. He, he worked with his hands as a laborer in a skilled carpentry position before he began the itinerant ministry. He seen his heavenly father supply in big and small ways, but he was not a lazy man. He entered the ministry and worked many, many, many hours a day ministering to people's needs. Much more effectively than a psychologist would do today, and psychologists believe they're worth a lot of money. They believe they should uh, get and that they deserve a six-figure income. And in our society, we don't look down on psychologists doing for desiring a six-figure income. And yet they are often far less successful helping people quite often than people who use biblical counseling. Biblical counseling can fix people because it deals with often the real issues in life, the issue of the heart. You don't believe me? Just check out the news this last week where a professional 
psychologist with a professional doctor helped a woman blind herself with Drano. Because she felt like she was born a crippled person even though she was whole and seen. She says, I feel like I am a blind person, and I deserve to be blind, and I want to be blind. They have a psychological term for this. And they wanted to affirm this, and this, this, this psychologist came from an Ivy League college. It was a Yale or something like that graduate. And wanted to help her affirm her blindness, because that's who she felt like she was inside. And after all, isn't that what we need to do, is tell people that whatever you think inside yourself, that's the real you, and we'll help you become that if you feel like a, a woman and you're a man. Well, we'll tell you you're a woman, and then we'll get a doctor to make you one. Or at least to snip away part of the manliness. <laughs> psychologists are here. They're not fixing people. They're hurting people. They're not helping people deal with the reality of the fact that they did, uh, have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome and I'm sorry, you are a man. Regardless of how you feel, it's what you are and this is how you need to deal with it. They're not dealing with the realities of things. They're affirming people who have talked themselves into craziness into confusion. And they say people who are affirmed that way end up deteriorating in life and uh, people who have sex change operations, even they're affirmed by their community, their family, and their doctors and told them that they're okay, they have the highest suicide rate amongst any group in the country. Any group of any individuals that you like to take and categorize and box into their little corner, those people even in a climate where they're being affirmed, have, still have the highest suicide rate. It says that something's not all the way right. <clears throat> well, here we have, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This is, this is just a principle that it is. And <clears throat> we have a way of justifying our perversions within ourselves, and yet scripture and truth are often contrary to that very same thinking. Look at verse number 15 so that we can read this. And it says, And he, Jesus said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. That which is esteemed before men is often that which is born out of the flesh and of our sinful nature, and that is often contrary to the Spirit and what God is talking about. And this can be said perhaps no more true than the, the things of the flesh, the, the categories of, of money and sex. Those categories perhaps get the most attention for men because that's the thing that men and women pursue the most. And it says here, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Let's go back to verse number one. And he said also unto the, his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accu accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear... This of thee, give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer a steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away my from me my the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. And resolve what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Now, a steward is a person who manages the affairs of a large household. Uh, imagine a rich man's large estate, and it is clearly something that's uh, more than he himself uh, can or cares to bother managing himself. He hires somebody. He hires a steward. And a steward is someone who is supposed to be capable of managing the mundane and minutia of running the household, and that would often include 
running the various servants that feed the household, the cooks, the cleaners, the gardeners, those that take care of the land and the business of the house, the banking and finances in the first century, because uh, they didn't typically have a bank per se like you would think of today. Uh, the rich men in society, they were the bankers. You needed a loan, you went to the bankers. You went to the rich man in town, and that, that's how things inevitably happened, is you got your loan from someone rich, and they, they carried you along. I heard a story about the uh, various Indians on the tribes, and it was an evangelist, amen? A gospel preacher that helped change this pattern. Uh, one of these famous evangelists that you would know, but he had his heart broken because he noticed how the in Guatemala, the Indians, the Mayans... Working for the large landowners, the Ladinos, they were not accustomed to drinking alcohol, and they found that the people of Indian blood got drunk much quicker, stayed drunk much longer, and their decision-making process often <clears throat> wasn't very good, and they would get themselves into gambling debts and all the sins that come along with heavy drinking. It often brought about a cascade of personal problems in their home. And what happened was the landowners would use uh, this addiction because when they got off, they were very tired from the work. And the landowners would own the, the liquor store and would encourage them and have, have men among them to encourage them to begin drinking. And once they got addicted they would often find themselves gambling and losing large amounts of money that would not go to their family. But as a result of that, they would continue drinking to drink away their sorrows. And when they became addicted, they needed to borrow money. They borrowed it from the rich man, the bank. And as a result of that, they were no longer free to leave because then they would exchange the debt for pay in the form of work. You'd have to work it off. Because you were taking loans from more or less organized crime. You had to work it off. And what it had happened was it began a cycle where a man, he might have a family, and he was addicted to the alcohol. And as a result of that, he was blowing through his money and borrowing money to supply for his family. And that meant he had to work more hours to keep himself above board. It created a vicious cycle. And this was not that long ago. It was in the last 100 years. And the evangelist saw that this had become a great problem in someone's life. Not everybody who drinks alcohol is necessarily going to behave irresponsibly. But when alcohol becomes your God, be sure it will rob you blind. It's a God that promises great things. But in the end, delivers misery and woe and pain to the people around you who love you and who you're responsible for. Well, the evangelist there in Guatemala saw this as a problem and said the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he tried to find a way to deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what happened? When people quit drinking, amen, and they got saved, and Jesus washed away their sins, and he delivered them from the chains of that bondage, the chains of that addiction, their financial problems began to clear up as well. God began to restore and put families back together. And the enslavement to the rich man ended when they got control of the enslavement inside, the tools of enslavement. When they broke those chains, they broke their chains in society. And God restored families and made good come out of that. In the first century, it was much the same. The more things change, the more they stay the same. In the first century, the Landlords, the, the large, wealthy landowners, would use their position of power to give out loans to the workers, and the workers were then indebted to work on their farms, to work their land, to work their cattle, to press their grapes, and to pick their olives. 
They no longer became day laborers, but they became indentured servants. And it is the nature to take advantage of that in the first century, even in Judaism, Jesus was preaching to a crowd of people who were living in a system like that. When they took these loans, they had high amounts of usury, high amounts of interest. And at times it gets to the place where a person cannot possibly pay the interest back because the interest or the loan back because the interest is too high, the debt is too high, and what do they do? They just stop paying, they run away. This household was looking at the steward and saying, why have you squandered my wealth? Good scholars believe it is because the steward had begun his practice by abusing those who owed his master in order to skim or to take off the top to perhaps embezzle for himself from those profits. But there is a law called diminishing returns. That means if you're trying to get blood out of a turnip, you're only going to get so much out. We all found that out as a nation with the credit card of our nation. This QE, this quantitative easing, the government borrowing money from itself and creating debt that you and I, the citizen, the workers, will have to pay off in the future. In the first round, they said, wow, we got some effectiveness, and it's healthy. In the second round, we had even more pumped into the economy, but we got half the effectiveness. The third round of quantitative easing, they said, did almost nothing for our economy. It was a giant waste of money because it was an artificial thing. It's like taking a drug. You get high at first, but it takes more and more to keep you high, to get that same effect, and eventually you're taking an enormous amount of the drug and you're not getting high at all. That's what happened with our nation. If you're managing a household like that, it will happen that way as well. If you're raising interest rates so high on people that they cannot pay you back, they stop paying. And this steward had lost the delicate balance of good business and bad stewardship over the, the poor that had the need and his master's wealth. So, he finds himself in the predicament, he finds himself in the predicament of unemployment himself. And there is no unemployment insurance, so he says, what am I going to do? I'm going to insure myself. How am I going to make a change? So he says, I'm resolved what to do, verse 4, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. He knew how to play the game. He was representing the rich household ruler but he says, I'm going to lose my job. How do I hedge my bet? Verse 5, so when he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. <laughs> then said he to another, and how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score eighty. <laughs> and the Lord commended unto the just, commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. Now, that seems interesting that he would say that, right? See, Jesus recognizes that he is an unjust steward. Is he an unjust steward because he slashed the prices to the poor, or was he unjust because he was abusing them in the first place? and squandering his master's wealth. This is a bit of the argument. <clears throat> you see, how you interpret this is important. You say, well, why? Well, there are scholars that will twist this entire passage into something else. We'll read on, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea where we're going. Jesus says in verse number 8, For the children of this world are in their generations wiser than the children of light. It's kind of a criticism on the children of light because, of course, you know, sometimes we're a bit naive uh, in our own honesty. That's the thing. We ourselves as Christians, amen, if we're children of light, we're very honest people. 
we're supposed to be. Honest, upstanding, right, and good in our dealings, and we can't imagine anybody who's not. That's the way we're supposed to be. We're naive. And, and Jesus isn't criticizing us for being naive, but as he would say in another passage, he says, we need to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. You need to know how the world works, and yet find a way to maintain your own cleanliness, even when you're working for somebody else. you got to know where to draw the line, amen? you got to know when to be able to say, hey, this is wrong, and i got to take a stand. I can't go along with this anymore. But you need to understand how does the world work. And how to be able to take advantage for you, for the kingdom of God, is a positive thing. But maintain your own innocency. You need to maintain your principles. The things you live by that guide you. How much is a product worth? <laughs> Does the market determine that, or do, does regulation in the market determine that? If you're in sales, I've been in sales, how much is a product worth? Something's worth what somebody else is willing to pay for it, right? Yeah. Is there something called gouging? Yes. Can't be. Paid three nineteen a gallon in Las Vegas for gas. Wow. I drove two states over and paid two nineteen a gallon within three days. Now I watch the price of oil owning an oil stock because my stock lives and dies with the price of Brent crude. Right now it's dead. And I can tell you nothing major has happened in the world in three days that has affected the price of Brent crude. Why is it three nineteen a gallon in Las Vegas and two nineteen a gallon in Arkansas? By the way, in Tennessee, I paid a dollar eighty nine for the same gas I paid three nineteen for in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a very progressive city. Tennessee is a very conservative place. Price difference was almost half <laughs> for the same exact gas. You can say, well, they've got to ship it farther. Really, I. I don't think so because technically Tennessee, from where they refine the stuff in, in Texas and in Louisiana, is the exact same distance to Las Vegas as it is in Tennessee. So you can't really tell me that. They're gouging them because they can. The politicians are doing that for their own gain. Roads are just as good in Tennessee as they were in Las Vegas. It's going somewhere now. Well, how, how, how much is, should stuff be cost? cost? Where on the Indian reservations, the price of everything was higher than you pay out here. Even though there is no tax on the reservation. <laughs> the Indians are gouging themselves. And I talked to the brother uh, on the Hopi reservation. He pointed out that there's one price for the white man and another for the Indian. And because he's been there so long, he's getting the Indian price. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> There's gouging, right? But something's worth what somebody else is willing to pay for. I got all bent out of shape about beef prices this week. You know that there's as many cows in America now as there was in 1952. Somebody is suppressing the level of cows being, being born. Now, cattle farmers in a free market would meet the demand. In 1952, you had a free market, and as a result of that, beef was cheap. Now you buy cheap beef, but it's not cheap. Went over even at the wholesale place, $12 a pound for ribeye, and stuff looks like a cut above dog meat. It's bad. It's gouging. Why? Because you have regulatory agencies that are artificially keeping the, the numbers of cows down so they can satisfy the environmental wacko people that think cow flatulence is gonna, gonna ruin the earth. Yes. These are the same people that say, oh well, you know, when the pioneers came west, they killed all the buffalo. That's a bad thing. But killing 30 million buffalo 
is a bad thing, but having 30 million cows is a good thing, or something like that. You understand what I'm saying? They talk out both sides of their mouth. They are artificially keeping the price of beef low, or the, the, the numbers of beef low, supply and demand. Population of the country has doubled. So there's half a cow for every person as there was before when there was a whole cow for every person. That means the price goes up artificially. You're paying a lot more to satisfy an environmentalist agenda. As I crossed this great country, I saw that there was lots and lots and lots of land not being used. Plenty of room for competition. Plenty of room for cows, sheep, goats. Plenty of room for all our needs, and yet you see them growing soybean. Corn. Mostly soybean. 30% of all our soybeans go directly to China. There's a lot of manipulation in the market, and you and I are the recipients. You like paying $4 a gallon for milk? You don't have to. If we double the number of milk cows in the country, you can still pay $2 a gallon, but four, almost $5 a gallon for milk, it hurts when you've got three children and you're going through four to five gallons a week, and that's just milk. There's manipulation in the market by people who have all kinds of agendas. Market is not free, or else it would find what the true value of everything is. Free market provides the true value of everything. Here we have an abuse of the system, and the wise steward or the unjust steward looking to hedge for himself. Drops prices, brings in the money, and as a result of that, cash flows in to the rich man. The rich man gets wealthier because the guy does right. <coughs> Verse 9 says, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the, unright in the unrighteous mammon, which is money, because mammon was the god of money and they used them as a common expression, who will commit to your trust true riches? And Jesus is recognizing what they say, unrighteous mammon, money... <clears throat> is a necessary evil. It's, it's what we use in the world as currency. Now you and I, perhaps as, as workers, as laborers, we earn our living, amen? We work hours, we, we produce a product, perhaps sell a product, create a good or a service, and, and on some level we earn what we earn. Somebody else in the world would say, well, that's not fair because I live here in East Africa and I work 12 hours a day and I get $3 a day. That's not fair that you're making 300 a day. Somebody in Mexico might say, well, I make $13 a day, and I work hard all day long, but you make uh, $1,300 a day. How, how do you know what's a fair wage? We look at the super rich and say, wait, for them, it doesn't look like they're fair. When they run the CEOs, and it, it sure it bothers me as much as anybody else to watch a company lose money and the CEO get extra bonuses. You hate to see the workers get shafted, too. While they're cutting jobs, the CEO gets more. It's just bad leadership to do that. It really looks bad, but it's bad leadership. Incrementally, of course, this company is able to save more. They took the hard thing to do, and they pay the CEO more, but it's bad leadership. It does not look good, and it gives ammunition to those who are criticizers. And we are in this perpetual circle and cycle of what is right and what is wrong concerning these things. How much should a CEO make? If there's a minimum wage, should there be a maximum wage? And who's to decide that? Who's to decide? A politician who they themselves are stealing the people blind in the name of helping the people? <laughs> who's to decide? You have a minimum wage? Raises the prices on everything else. You have a maximum wage? You will literally kill incentive. Is there a sweet spot? Well... There's a lot of people that will argue about that. 
Jesus makes it clear, though, unrighteous mammon is a part of the world. Money is a part of the world we live in. But for Christians, we are expected to have a different view, how you think about the world and yourself in it and your belief about money and salvation and eternity. What you think is eternal, what you think is temporal makes a difference in how you live your life. If you're faithful and unrighteous mammon, God will commit to you riches. But God's sense of riches isn't earthly riches. God's sense of riches is much deeper than that. God's sense of riches are heavenly riches. And, and there's another passage that kind of explains this. But you know, as we look at this passage, Jesus says clearly in verse 13, No man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or else will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees are deriding him because he knows that they are the targets of his speech. This is a very confusing passage because you wonder, is Jesus criticizing rich men? Is he elevating poor people? Is he affirming uh, dubious policies of business? A great deal of argument. Dr. Thomas Boomshire who was a professor emeritus at uh, it's a United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, which is one of the 13 United Methodist seminaries. He is uh, one of their spokespersons. He does not really believe the Bible is true and should be taken literally and a lot of other stuff. He, he believes the Bible is something to use for their advantage politically and they play high, loose and fast with the scriptures. You see, in our passage, <clears throat> verse number 9 it says, make to yourselves friends of the mammon and of unrighteousness, and when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. When ye fail, he interprets, he says, you know, people interpret it this way, but what it really means is when it collapses, or literally when it pow its power collapses, when its power collapses. That's it, he says, you should translate this, when its power collapses. That's interesting, because it says, when ye fail. I wonder, does my King James Bible make a mistake, right? If you listen to this United Methodist, you think, well, maybe there's something there. So you go in and you, you open up your Textus Receptus, and you look at it, and you say, wow. It speaks in the second person, and the word that it uses is an interesting word, because it's a word for eclipsis. It's the future of eclipsis, which is eclipso, eclipo, where we get our word eclip. It's translated to fail here in our passage, amen? Yes. That is a pretty good translation, amen? It's metaphoric. It's got the idea of to leave out, to pass by. Uh, during the Maccabean period, the Maccabeans used it metaphorically in that stage of Greek, in the development of the Greek language, to die, to be eclipsed is the idea that is died, and of course be reborn. We get our word eclipse for the sun and the moon from that. But it doesn't mean when it, the power collapses. It's an interpretation that uses to translate. And, and what's the problem here is in the Greek text, it's in the second person. The King James Bible's got it right. When ye fail. When you all fail. It's the second person plural. Not it, because he turns it around and says, not you failing, but rather the system of money and power fails. And from this bad translation, by this bad denomination of progressives, they build the theology of socialism on it. Because he says further that... <clears throat> Rejecting the system of capitalism and embracing this redistribution, that this is the way, and these are his quotes, this is the way to ensure your future in the kingdom of God. The way to ensure your future in the kingdom of God is to work the system of this age in the interest of poor people. That's socialism. It's a foundation 
of that progressive theology. They're changing the theology of the Bible so that they can change the way people think about themselves and the world. And notice it's a works-oriented salvation. See, in order for you to obtain salvation, and he looks at it as if Jesus is talking to him in a special class of intellectuals, a special class of politicians, because at this prestigious university for progressive thinking, they are training young leaders. So they start with a bad translation with a trick. They change its power collapse, given the idea that the money system will collapse. And as when that happens, Jesus is going to force that to happen, that you will be saved if you were careful to redistribute the wealth of others to the poor. You will be saved. You say, Pastor, that sounds ridiculous. Can he possibly really mean that? Well, let's see. He also says, in the new age, they, meaning the poor, are the ones who are the gatekeepers for the kingdom of God. And of course, he misinterprets that as blessed are the poor, right? So it is the poor who will judge you whether you have redistributed enough to them and you will be allowed to be in the kingdom of God when the new age comes. You can see already he doesn't believe in the rapture, doesn't believe in the tribulation, believes that they through their work of redistributing wealth in the name of Christ, will create an equitable society, an equal society of equal pay, and, and that the poor will judge you, and they will be the ones that allow you to come into the kingdom of heaven as it just society mutates or evolves into that kingdom. This is a prominent professor emeritus of a major denomination of America teaching young skulls full of mush. I lost some of you there. In the end, what he says is being poor is good. We should all strive to be poor. While he sells books and makes hundreds of thousands of dollars through his denomination. But the important thing is we're all equal. Just some of us are more equal than the others, especially us who are in charge to make sure that the other equal ones get an equal share and we get a little extra equal share for doing that. I tell you this because it's important to know the world that we live in. Liberation theology is based on that thinking. The Bishop of Rome who just passed through the United States did his services here in New York City went down to our Congress and spoke before our House and Senate. This man who spoke in Cuba about religious freedom, the Bishop of the Roman Church, believes in that theology. He is a liberation theologian. It dominates a lot of the black church thinking in New York City. Liberation theology. That Jesus, community organizer, was a great man because he was out to steal from the rich and give to the poor. Robin Hood style. Of course, Robin Hood stole from the government and gave back to the people because he was stealing from Little John and the King, which was the government, and giving it back to the people. So he wasn't really stealing from the rich, he was stealing from the government, giving it back. People's tax money. But uh, that's a different story. Point is this. This presents some real theological challenges. Is Jesus really out there to make everybody poor? Is the Bible affirming that this is a bad thing to have any money, that we should feel guilty because we have prospered in America? If you get a good paying job, should you feel guilty that other people have less than you? These people would tell you Jesus wants you to feel guilty. And yet, Jesus is very balanced in this opinion. He, he, he gives us some perspective here. But the Bible isn't finished with this. The Bible lets us know that, hey, you know what? Money is a temptation. It is a problem. Turn to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter number 6 quick. And we're almost wrapped up. We're going to look at a couple things and bat them quick. I try to draw this out for you to see this morning. <clears throat> Because we really are in a battle for theology and balanced thinking. 
The Bible does not condemn people just because they are rich. Chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verse number 5, it says, uh, Perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. These people are supposing that getting rich means you're equal with godliness, and from such turn away. But he says, listen, godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 6, well, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Yep. Is not the Holy Spirit of God managing a Christian's expectations in life, what we are supposed to be living for, right? Yes. And he says, why? Because there's a temptation. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And into many, what? Foolish and hurtful lusts. You know, Americans have gotten so used to being rich, we don't understand what it's like to not be rich. But over 15 years here in New York City, I've watched people from all over the world who, who come from the third world, often in poverty, uh, whether it is from India or China or Russia or Africa, and they come into New York, and we try to evangelize these people, and we have uh, not a lot of success, even with people who, in their countries, claim to be Baptists and attend church every week. And when they come to America, something happens when they come to New York. They look around, and they were told the streets are paved with gold, and they see that it's not. Yeah. But there is opportunity here that they have never seen before, and one of the first things they do is they take a big sip to a gulp of opportunity. And they find that making money here is easy. Making money here is much easier than it is in their own country, and they have access to wealth for them that they could never dream of at home. Because at home, there's so many bribes to pay. There's, there's lack of opportunity. There's your old family pushing you down, telling you you can't. And you come here, and they tell you, hey, you can. You can be rich. There are other people from your country right here. And they're driving fancy cars, and they're wearing fancy clothes, no, never mind the fact that they're paying way too much for a, a scrawny little apartment mm -hmm. that's run down with paint falling off of the walls in chunks. And yet they'll drive a fancy car and have the nice clothes and buy dinners out and they can act like the big shot. Right? And they come fresh off the boat and they see their compatriot, they see their countrymen saying, Wow, I can be a big shot too because he was a nobody in, his, in our country. I can be a somebody here. And as an American, we love to know that you can feel that way. That you look at our country and say, man, this is an opportunity. You can be richer. You can really make something yourself. You can be somebody here. But you know, as a Christian, I've got to warn you. If you pursue money like that and you love it like that, you cannot serve two masters. The God that you loved in your country will quickly begin to fade in your mind. The passion you felt in service is the stirring of the Holy Ghost. And I have seen so many young people, young Russians come into our church and they can remember and feel the moving of the Holy Ghost. And they can remember what it was like in their country. And then they walk out the doors and they start making money and it's like a shot in their arm. It's a heroin that slowly makes them numb. In the first day it's still warm but by Wednesday and Thursday that spirituality starts to fade. The memory of God's presence is fading because they're working and working and working and there's opportunity to, to not just make money but to sin. Nobody's here watching. I got invited to a party. I got invited to a club. I got invited to this or to that. And, and it's so much fun because you know what? Nobody's watching. If I get in trouble, nobody will know. If I make a mistake, mom and dad will never find out. My friends won't look down on me because they're all into it too. Friday and Saturday night, they can't remember how good it was last Sunday. when 
the alcohol and the marijuana or whatever else and the thumping of the rhythms of the beat get done with their mind on Saturday night, they're not getting up the next Sunday. How many times have I seen Christian young people, lives getting out of control, come in, cry at the altar, get right with God, and then the next week you can't find them. The love of money. The love of money, it says very clearly, they have done what? Thrust themselves through. Right? <clears throat> Verse 9 of chapter 6, they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. That's the biggest danger. I do believe there's probably 100,000 Christians People who profess their faith and, and, and profess to be born again in their country or somewhere else, maybe even Americans, where, wherever they come from in the country, living here in the city. Easily 100,000 of them should be filling our churches. They believe like we believe. But they've learned to love money more than God. I talked to them on the street. They can't get themselves up on Sunday because of the love of money. And they've stopped trying. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Yep. But thou, O man of God, woman of God, child of God, are you a child of God this morning? Mm -hmm. Flee these things. Flee these things. Look at verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to what? To enjoy. That is the warning. God is not against you being wealthy or wealthier than somebody else. If you live here, you have money that is in a quantity that is more than somebody else who lives in another country. Poor people in the ghetto in America live as good as the middle class in most of Europe. Mm -hmm. The poorest in our culture technically, socially live better than the middle class in Europe. And certainly better than the middle class and most of China. Everybody has people who are richer than them in this world's wealth. Everybody has people who are poorer than them in this world's wealth. It's the way it is. There is no equal society. There never will be an equal society. Jesus himself said, you have the poor with you always. Because in his society, it wasn't always equal. There's a difference between the working poor and the willing poor and the unwilling poor. Big, big difference. The welfare poor who could work but don't, it is a type of enslavement and a great indignity in and of itself. When Jesus affirms the poor, he affirms the working poor and he affirms those who cannot possibly help themselves. The Bible has not one good thing to say about lazy people. Try as you might. There is zero compassionate statements in the Bible for lazy people. Yep. Not one. People who could work but make excuses not to work. The Bible talks about them. The Bible says they ought to be allowed to get what they deserve. The blueness of a wound will teach you something. Pain and suffering can heal a bad character. <laughs> if you empower laziness, you will get more laziness. If you empower excuses, you will get it. Everybody's got something wrong. When you see an old woman walking to work and her knees barely work and her back hurts and she got up with a headache and she's got a plethora of problems, she goes to work, Anyway, without complaining and taking a government check, 
and you see a young man sitting on the corner over here on 18th Avenue saying, God bless you with his sign out, and he's all of 19 years old begging for money, not a thing wrong with him, except his character. Go and I give that kid not a dime. Yep, that's right. Not a dime. All you're doing is empowering that bad behavior. Jesus doesn't affirm that anywhere. He says we have an obligation to take care of those who cannot possibly help themselves. But our society has gotten so far away from anything called common sense. Gotten so far away from the scripture. And I tell you, if you're empowering lazy people, then you are not being compassionate. You're easing your own conscience because you've been made to feel guilty for having more than someone else. And you shouldn't. You should not feel guilty because there is always somebody who has less than you. Always someone who has more than you. You have your place somewhere. That's why he says, having food and raiment, just learn to be content with what you have. But here in this passage, what does it say? It says, God giveth us richly all things to enjoy. He didn't say, rich people stop being rich, does it? Because really, rich is a relative term. The Bible isn't correcting rich. It doesn't say if you have this dollar amount, you're rich. If you make this multiple more than the average person, you're rich. It doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say rich people are evil. It says rich people have a danger of losing their faith because of a love for money. It says rich people have a danger of piercing themselves with temptations because money gives you access to temptation. If you can afford a mistress, you might have one. There are a lot of men in this country who don't have a mistress because they can't afford one. <laughs> but I know a lot of rich men that don't have mistresses because they love God. God doesn't say we shouldn't enjoy the fruits of life. But what does it say? It says, rich people, don't be high-minded. Don't trust in uncertain riches. Because you know what? Eventually things do collapse. And the things you do do to the working poor, to the poor who cannot possibly help themselves. The good that you do in this world, as it says here, be ready to distribute, right? Mm -hmm. Be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate with them. To communicate means to, to, to meet a need, to be able to see a need in the need. Mm -hmm. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, mm -hmm. that they may hold, lay hold on eternal life. We're all richer than somebody else. In Africa, you're rich. You're a rich American. Doesn't matter what color you are. White, black, purple, green. Almost all of Africa, you will be considered a rich person. And it's hard to go to Africa and not see the need and want to help. I appreciate you because if you're a Christian, you ought to feel that need. Some of us might feel just like crying. Others might think... Hey, we can do something here. The worst is when you can't do things for people who, who, who won't accept your help. When we were on the Hopi Indian Reservation, what broke my heart the most wasn't the fact that they were dirt poor. After 120 to 150 years of government welfare, they are the original welfare recipients to Native Americans because they have contracts signed by treaty that the government, the federal government, will give them welfare, take care of them. They have 87% unemployment on the Sioux Reservation. Similar unemployment numbers throughout the Navajo, Hopi, Shoshone, Blackfoot, Crow tribes. They all have similar, they get a government check and food stamps. They don't pay taxes and they get a government check and food stamps. They have their own country that they can make their own rules in to a limited degree, but the debauchery is awful. One person told me, hey, you don't want to go. We drove through a reservation. He says, oh, I can't believe you did that. You don't want to be there at night. Indians don't even want to be there at night. It's dangerous. Like the south side of Chicago. Child rape is common. Too much idle hands. Covering it up is even more common. Because it's so cultural, it's ingrained in them. Violence, alcoholism, drug abuse. Epidemic. Broken families, epidemic. Huge swaths of land, 
complain about all the bisons that the pioneers killed off all the bisons. They have their own land. There are zero bisons. So no cows. Nobody's chasing a cow. Nobody's hunting deer and stuff like that. Subsistence living is just not that very common. They get a government check that the, the cornfields we saw, unbelievably mangy, poorly kept. There's a natural spring on the side of a hill. This green hill, the, all the way up the hill, was green in the middle of a desert. One or two mangy little gardens on a terrace. All the blocks looked like they had stopped and been built. They, they, they not maintained them for, for 80 years. Water literally seeping out of the ground at that spot and permeating the entire side of the mountain. They could grow lush crops if they just terraced that. Their ancestors did terrace that, create terraces of, of plagues. That's what they did. And they said, we're so proud of being like our ancestors. And these things were absolutely mangy. They have signs that say, Taking, take no pictures. It's because they say how proud they are to live the way they are, but then they don't want you to actually see it. They don't want anybody to see how bad it is. <laughs> Dirt floors, dirty kids. The houses, these mud huts where the grout's all coming out, missing ceilings. Brand new car in the driveway. 80 to 90 percent unemployment, epidemic in good times and in bad times. The original welfare recipients. It's bad. We haven't done anything to help them that way. You can give them all the money in the world. It doesn't help them. You go on the, the reservations where, where they've got casinos and, and, and other things. It's bad. The common person is shafted. The people at the top are rich. The important thing is where is your heart and what God gives you. He's given us all things richly to enjoy. You ought to feel bad. I felt bad for them. The thing I felt bad most about is they were so proud to keep their Indian heritage that they refused to adopt any modern ways. The village we stayed in had just received electricity in some parts of it because they were so poor though, because they refused to advance. They refused to change. They said, this is the way we are. They didn't want to adopt what they called the white man's ways. They had no problem cashing the white man's check. They didn't want to adopt his ways. Complained about how the coal companies are stealing all the water out of the aquifer underneath them. And they themselves refused to drill aquifers for, for watering their fields. Dry farmers and these major little corn crops. Unbelievable. It's a slavery of the mind. You can't help people who don't want help. You can't help people who aren't willing to help themselves, who aren't willing to, to try for themselves, aren't willing to change, aren't willing to adapt, aren't willing to be creative, aren't willing to, to find a way to do good. You can't help them. There are people like that in every society always. But we're here to help those who can, amen? Amen. Let your heart be touched by the needs of people around the world. Let it be touched. But let it be touched so that they can have an improvement in life that they certainly can become more comfortable in life. But when all said and done, aren't we trying to reach people with the gospel? Yeah. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about forgiveness of sins and new life, a new opportunity and salvation. It is not about redistributing wealth in creating a great kingdom of God through an egalitarian society. Atheism could not create an egalitarian society. Theism will not create an egalitarian society. And you know what? God's not trying to create an egalitarian society. But what he does want is he wants every individual personally responsible for him or herself to keep their things in balance. To not hold on too tight to the things of this world. Be ready when God gives you an opportunity to do good in this world. Be ready to distribute, to communicate with people's needs. To, to not be stingy, but to, to see where people are. To help people who are trying to help themselves. 
when you have the right attitude, there's no reason that everybody can't be a winner. The pie isn't just so big and it's got to be equally distributed to everybody. The pie can grow so that everybody can have more. Everybody can do better. Everybody can live more comfortably. Everybody can see an alleviation in suffering, but there are some people who they cause their own suffering. You can't help them. But you need to be ready to help those who are willing to help themselves. And you do it because you love God, not because you have to. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I believe most people across the sound of my voice here this morning, they have made a decision. They have chosen Jesus Christ to be their personal Lord and Savior. When he calls you, it is certain that he will call you to give up everything. And though he takes everything, he will give you back most things. The life of discipleship is a life of surrender. It's a life of a proper attitude that all the things in this world that you have, they're not really yours. You are that steward. Everything you have really belongs to God. And you are responsible to maintain it as if it was your own property. But remember, it's God's. And do good with it. If you need to ask Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior, the one thing you need to do is come to God and, and realize that no matter how much you have in this world, that you are destitute of all heavenly riches in and of yourself, all your good works that are done apart from the motivation of the presence of God in your life, all those things will not get you into heaven and they cannot forgive the bad things you've done. Your sins have separated you from God and this is what God needs to forgive and this is something that you come to God, you have absolutely nothing to bring Him. You cannot buy salvation. You cannot earn your salvation. You have to let God give you the gift of salvation. Isn't it a beautiful thing to know that God, who is rich and owns everything in the universe, that he has given to us all good things to enjoy, that he has been willing to leave those things and communicate with you through the person of Jesus Christ? <laughs> let Jesus Christ serve you. Let him forgive you. Let him wash away your sins. Call out on him today and say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve to be forgiven. I know I don't deserve eternal life. But Lord Jesus, I have absolutely nothing to give in exchange for this salvation. But I do believe because you love me. I believe that. I trust that. You love me that you want to forgive me. Jesus, you are willing to give up everything and die in my place so that I can have eternal life. Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Save me. If you open your heart today, Jesus Christ won't turn you away. We're going to have the Lord's Supper in a few moments. It is appropriate. It's a time of reflection and a time to remember the covenant which God has made with you and that you have made with God. You do not have a right to take the bread and the wine of the covenant in the flesh if you have not done so in the spirit. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've not received him into your heart and life, if you have not made covenant with him and been born again, and you know that you're born again, you do not have a right to take of the Lord's Supper because you're living a lie. If you take the bread and the wine this morning and you have not been born again, you are lying to yourself and lying to God if you're not born again. 
But if you have asked Jesus Christ and received him into your heart, Lord, you've accepted the blood of the covenant, you identify with the, the broken body of Christ, and you've broken yourself <coughs> and received this blood of the covenant, and you have been born again, you have received the gift of God, this table and this memorial supper is open to you. Because this morning we once again affirm that truth in ourselves before the presence of God. God, I belong to you. God, I have received you. God, I willingly acknowledge I still hold to you. That this Jesus, Jesus, you are my Savior. Christian, it's a time of cleansing. It's a time to purify. You go through your life and examine yourself and see if there is something you need to confess to the Lord this morning. Don't confess it to me. I'm a sinner. If in private you need help with something and you need counsel, I'd be happy to do that later, but you, if you need your sins forgiven, in your heart you need to talk to God because he's the one that forgives you. I can forgive you for the crimes that you've committed against me. I can affirm to you if your heart is right that God has forgiven you. But only you will know if you've forgiven in your heart from God if you're honest and you talk to him personally. Christian, this is an opportunity to do some house cleaning. Get some things straight. Get some things right. church, this is a time of communion with each other. When we take this in one spirit as a body and we feed together ourselves as one body. Remember that we have a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, a commitment to our own personal walk with him, and we have a commitment to our church and the people around you that you'll see. You have a commitment and a duty to minister to them in a variety of ways through prayer, through a good word, through grace and kindness when it's necessary, times of trouble and pain. You take this body and blood of Christ together, remembering that we are a body in church. Thank you. 